I have always been considered strange because uh, I was a doctor and then I stopped my medicine, started doing watercolors, sitting on the roadside and I was doing very well as a doctor. I did not give it up because I was not doing well. I was very extremely successful. So first thought a doctor has gone crazy. I mean, he's a, such a good practice and now he sits on the roadside and does some painting. And one old man asked me, normally people like to climb up the ladder of success. Why do you come down? It is all right until they did my watercolors. Then I started planting shells. So for most people, the idea of planting shells as a profession was the most weird thing to do for an adult. I learned my basic painting skills from my father. Initially, I did rather traditional watercolors. And for the last 20 years, I have been experimenting with different mediums, different kinds of work. And then I traveled around the world. And I would say that I learned my work from museums of modern art. Initially, when I went to Tate Modern, for example, I did not understand most of the works because I was not trained to understand them. And then I thought either I am a fool or they are taking me for a ride. I decided maybe I am a fool, let me learn. And that started the process. And after some time, I mean, it was wonderful. A kind of a Pandora's box was opened to me by the museums, by the art fairs, by the biennales. And here am I basically doing a lot of conceptual work now. Turning a walk into a sculpture, uh, which uh, Richard Long floated, I was really fascinated by that idea, the concept of making a walk into a sculpture. And I had done some lamps, so I took one of my lamps, a, bra a copper lamp, went to the beach, dug a crater, placed my disc on the top of the crater with the electrical bulbs underneath it and uh, electrical wire running under the sand, took the electrical connection from a beach shack. And when I put the light on, I was stunned. It was not intentional what I did. This was almost accidental. And my first piece, first piece of land art is called a tenth planet because I felt like God, I felt I have created a planet. Most of my work, uh, which I do on the beach, is very temporary, which is ephemeral. It reminds me of a lovely poem by Tagore, who is my favorite poet. It says, the waves write their poetry on the sand and not satisfied, wipe them off over and over again. So my works are kind of my poetry on the sand and the, the, the waves wipe them off too. There will be some works which I do with shells which will just last until the high tide comes. Uh, that's again a few hours. Well, I consider myself an ocean artist, a sea artist, because as a child, I used to go for a walk from the age of 6 to 16 with my father every day for two hours. We have hardly missed a day. And those walks were actually uh, very important to me that not only uh, sort of created a great relationship between me and my father, but also uh, gave my father instilled a lot of dreams into me. We would sit down and watch the waves break, the surf run onto the sand and wet sand. But most of the waves broke and wet the same sand which was wet before. And then a bigger wave would come, hurry ahead and wet new sand. And my father told me, son, anything what you do it is most important to wet new sand. I do not know whether in my artistic endeavors I have wet new sand, but if I have not, I will try my best too. And this kind of walks sort of created a great relationship between me and the sea. The sea became a friend, a master and a muse and an inspiration. And so a lot of my work is now connected with the ocean. When I plant shells, it is not just because they are beautiful, it looks interesting. When I do that, there's a wonderful a kind of a symbiotic relationship, uh, inspiration, uh, medium, and the canvas. The sea is my canvas, the shells are given to me by the sea, uh, the sea is the inspiration, and sea is also the theme. I have worked with sand and light. Every child, when a child is asked to do a sunset picture, they just a sun and a triangle of lines. So I decided to create my triangle of lines with just some uh, kind of uh, burrows and light behind. See, I'm always open to all kinds of materials. And uh, with this new material, the old truck tires, which I very often use now, which I got acquainted with in Jaipur. In Jaipur, I saw a shop selling products made out of old truck tires. Uh, when I bought this material, I didn't know what I will do with it. And I thought that on the roads of Rajasthan, the soles of the camel fit get worn out and so do the tires of the trucks. So I decided to make a camel foot with old truck tires. The ideas are important to me and then new materials fascinate me. 
So uh, one day I was doing an interview with a cane maker and I found this story very interesting and the way he was working. So I decided, okay, I made a drawing and said, can you do that? And he did it for me. And then we just uh, used them as lamps in a festival. So I've always been fascinated with boats. Uh, the wooden boats, especially the way the two pieces of wood are joined to create the boats. Uh, for me, that's uh, wonderful. And I have been, as a child, clicking pictures of the surfaces of boats because the surfaces are so rich. Because for 50, 60 years, the waves have played upon the body of the boat, creating all these surfaces. And I loved them. And then, uh, slowly, the fishermen are now using fiberglass boats because they're cheaper, they're lighter, they consume less petrol, and so they sell the old boats. They don't know what to do with them. So one day I bought an old boat, and I started working with this, and it was a wonderful experience because here I was working with a boat which was already in use for 60, 70 years. So the whole story of the boat is incorporated in my sculpture, which I make out of this boat. So it's like using history as a medium for sculpture itself. The songs of the fishermen, the, the lines, the grooves made by the rope which pulled the nets into the boat, uh, the waves playing and making those textures, all that becomes part of my sculpture. When I was asked to do this installation, one of the biggest problems was this uh, big hotel, Burj Arab. Now Burj Arab was so dominating, to do something next to it which will stand was a big challenge. But Interestingly, what happened was because of the shape of the boats and I put them vertical, it just goes very well. I realized that the oceans which separate the continents were also responsible for uniting the continents. I was a doctor practicing on the seaside. I had a hospital where I said the babies were born to the music of the waves because it was that near. Uh, all the fishermen were my patients. And uh, I realized that their life is so much intimate with the ocean. It is almost inseparable. And that idea of inseparability fascinated me. Because if you have studied the life of the fishermen, they don't sleep at home. They sleep on the beach under the open sky. They get up in the, in the, in the middle of the night, push the boat, go into the ocean, come back early morning, the wives are waiting with the breakfast, and they carry the fish they have brought to the markets. And then the whole life is totally connected. And what I realized is in spite of the tourism, the life of a lot of fishermen remains unaffected. I decided that I will do something expressing this idea of inseparability. So the fishermen become the boat. The fishermen become the fish. The whole history of human civilization is dissolved in the ocean. And through my work, I try to precipitate that history. Indigo is another very important commodity in the ships which sail from uh, India. Uh, indigo is a color which is supposed to have seduced the world and it has been used for times immemorial and uh, initially indigo came from a plant. When Gandhi arrived in India, he had come with uh, his paraphernalia of new experiments with his uh, satyagraha and the first uh, satyagraha in India was actually to help the indigo workers. There were some very interesting uh, dramas written in Bengal one is called Neela Darpan, which is about the indigo. And so indigo really fascinated me and the, I loved the color. And then I found this very wonderful way of doing it that I started covering rocks with indigo. Initially, when I started covering the rocks, I didn't know how to do it because first I went with a uh, hundred toilet papers and some glue, thinking that I will cover the rock with um, toilet paper and then uh, apply indigo to it. And then I also carried a sieve and it was very windy. And I just put a little bit of indigo in the sieve and just tapped it and the wind did the job. What I had thought would take 10 hours was done within 10 minutes by the wind. And just within half a kilo of indigo, I could cover a huge rock. And that's how this uh, series started. The ocean was a vehicle, is an enzyme, uh, a medium for uh, intercontinental cultural diffusions. Chilies, for example, we never had in India. Chilies were there only in South America. And chilies were brought by the Portuguese in 1500. And within 50 years, they spread all over India, Southeast Asia, and China, and Japan. Uh, and we cannot think of Indian food without chilies now. And very few Indians will be aware that chilies are not from India. 
I made some chilies which are covered with Rajasthani cloth, kind of Indianization of chilies. So basically all this history I try to stir with my work. It was not just chilies, even the religions got Indianized. If you go to Kerala, Christianity arrived in India much before it went to Europe. In 52 AD, uh, Thomas the Apostle came to Kerala and the first church was built in Kerala. And uh, slowly, uh, there were uh, transformations happening even in the way the cross was depicted. So I have made one of the works where actually I have clad the cross with Krishna's dress. I was invited to do a work in a garden in Lisbon. And this garden has been existing ever since the days of Vasco da Gama. There was a chapel in the garden and even Vasco da Gama has prayed in that chapel before setting sails for India. So since the Portuguese managed to change the full uh, food uh, history of India, I decided I will take a kind of a poetic revenge. So I carried rice from Goa and planted it in that garden, tracing the root of Vasco da Gama. So when the rice grew there, it just did not grow rice, but it sprouted history. I started uh, reading uh, more and I realized that uh, a pepper was so very uh, important. Uh, a pepper actually determined the history of India. If we did not have pepper, perhaps the colonial powers would not come here. They came to control the, the, the pepper trade, which was earlier held by the Arabs, and they wanted an alternate route. That's how Vasco da Gama found an alternate route, because through Arabia, it was impossible for them to defeat all the Arabs and come through Arabia. And many countries in Europe use pepper as a currency. Pepper has played such a very important role. So then slowly I started exploring pepper. The pepper cross, uh, actually, it was, I wanted to create a form of a cross. And initially the idea was to put uh, real peppercorns on the whole surface. But how to put the peppercorns? So I decided to make a little bit of a hole. And then I realized that I don't need to put any pe peppercorns there because that itself was wonderful. Cotton, incidentally, grew only in India. Uh, not in Europe and they had such myths and such misinformation about cotton even in 13th century an Englishman writes about cotton he says there in India exists a tree called cotton uh, it grows lambs at the tip of the branches and the lambs uh, can feed on grass because the branches are very pliable and the lambs produce wool which is called cotton and so I decided to make my cotton pods and have a head of lamb and then the whole area of the cotton I covered with crochet designs because crochet was brought from by Portuguese it is Portuguese uh, technique of uh, knitting and it is uh, it came from Portugal and the cotton went from here so I'm sort of uh, there are many layers in my work there are historical layers social layers aesthetic layers 